you see what I see? <laughs> Jesus' public ministry began in Luke 4 when he said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. Set to set opposed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Oftentimes we see, but we don't see. This is a description used in script, the description used in scripture to describe people still living in sin. You might have be familiar with the term living in darkness. Their eyes are not opened. It's kind of like when you're um, watching a football game and your wife says, "Did you take out the garbage?" And you say, uh-huh, right? But later on, you realize you answered the question, but you did not take out the garbage. Your hearing is intact, but your listening was not present. Same thing sometimes with what we see. The first eye-opening experience in this story is the Ar about the Armenian, or yeah, I knew I was going to do that. I told John, be careful how you say that. <laughs> the Arameans were in constant battle with the Israelites, and they were arch enemies. Now, the Arame Arameans had a bigger, stronger army, and the problem was they couldn't win because Israel had Elijah who kept warning them of where their troops were. So the king, the king says to um, his men, we need to find this guy Elijah. So they go down to the town where he's at, and they surround the city where he's at. And when they wake up in the morning, the servant looks out and says, oh no, we're doomed. We're surrounded by the enemy. Now, Elijah, a man of faith and a prophet, already knows that there's nothing to worry about. God will protect him. But he asks God to open his servant's eyes so that he could see the army surrounding him. It's... It's one of my favorite verses, and I was trying to understand how I could use this in a sermon. And my eyes were opened when I started researching more about this sermon, and, uh, or what I could say about this sermon. So we all often like this servant who can see physically, but did not see the sp spiritual reality right in front of him. And he could see the big enemy and the fact that Elijah were in danger. In Acts 9, 8, Saul, who was at the time was persecuting Christians, many of you are familiar with this story, was blinded by God for three days. In verse 17, Ananias was sent to Saul, so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. Symbolic of those living in sin, we do not see what's going on around us. Think about it. How long did you know about God and Jesus before your eyes were opened to him and maybe committed to making the decision? I know I was raised in a church at one time, though I still am being raised in a church. <laughs> I was raised in a church one time and I knew who God and Jesus was, but I had no idea about what I was supposed to do to that until my eyes were opened. I wasn't physically blind. When Elijah's servants saw the Syrian army surrounding them in 2 Kings, Elijah responded, don't be afraid, the prophet answers. Those who are with us are more, more than those who are with him. God is bigger and more powerful. He is here to protect. This is why Paul is able to say without hesitation in Romans 8.31, if God is with us, who can be against us? And again in Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Who can say this except for someone who knows God and has spiritually seen him at work in their own life? This is why I'm always telling people that the walk with the Lord is a practice. You've got to just keep on practicing, practicing, practicing. And as the song goes, it will become easier to understand and you will continue to learn. The Bible is called the Living Bible, not because it gets up and walks or anything, but because you can always read it and always gain something of it. It doesn't matter how old you are, and I'm sure many of the people that are older than me can attest to the fact that it's a living document, living, breathing document. And to understand that, you have to practice and follow what the Lord tells you to do. So it's a continual practice to understand him better by and by, as the song goes. 
God the powerful warrior. Seen through spiritual eye, God, uh, the God Elisha believes in, the God Elisha's servant now knows, and the God that we proclaim is a warrior God. I fear my grandson Gage would like that. He wants to be a Marine one day. So our God is a warrior God, okay? And he is all powerful and almighty. Now, in Exodus 15, 2, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. This is why the Israelites were reminded up until this passage that we're reading in Kings that God is a powerful warrior. It may be the reason why they expected a king to come back and to wipe out their enemies and be a, a, a worldly type of king who ruled over the nations, which is not, of course, what happened. Here are three examples of God, the powerful warrior. In Exodus, Exodus 17, when the Amicalites attached the Israelites, elderly Moses had to stand on top of his hill with his hand raised to God. You may remember that story where they actually, his arms got weak from holding it up, and then the warriors started losing. So they had two people come up and actually hold his arms up so that they could win the battle. Now, I always wondered what the battle looked like in that scenario. You know, when you're fighting, the men are fighting, and all of a sudden his arms stop to drop, and all of a sudden they're losing and now his arms up again and they start to win what did that look like you know well it really doesn't matter what it looked like because the point of the story is it doesn't matter what they did on the battlefield if you were on the camera crew the focus was not on the battle the focus in the story is on Moses and it's on Moses because he's praising the Lord and doing what God told him to and God won the battle not the Israelites and that's God being our powerful warrior the Jericho Wall story, everybody's familiar with that. There's actually a little song, I couldn't remember, where they marched around and the walls came down and God came up or something. I don't know, maybe wrong song. But anyway, um, the Israelites were told to march around the building once a day for seven days. And on the seventh day, they were marched around seven times, blow their trumpets, yell and scream and everything else. Now, I've actually heard analogies where people tried to, to, to um, explain how structurally, by marching, you can bring down the walls. And I say, okay, if you want to go with that, go ahead. But the point in this is what the reason it happened and the way it's told before the people marched in Joshua 6 2, it says, The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with his king and fighting men. So even if that structural thing is true, do you think those people back then really thought of all that before they went marching around that building? You know? So again, it's God who won the war for them or the battle. In Judges chapter 7, this is a really cool story too, when the Midianites were against the Israelites who already oppressed them, God raised up Gideon. So if you remember in that story, Gideon gathers all the men who are of a battle age, which, you know, 21 or older, and he had 32,000 men ready to go into battle. And God said, that's too many. So he asked all the men who might be in fear to go back home. So 22,000 of them left. That probably would have been me, by the way. Yeah, I don't want to do this if I don't have to. <laughs> but anyway, so 22,000 left. He's left with 10,000. And God says, that's still too many. And this is part of the story I really like. They told him, go down to the water and drink from the, the, the uh, river, whatever it is. And those men who take the water up into their hand and sip it, keep them. And all those people that go down and lap the water like a dog, get rid of them. And he did. And he's left with 300 men. Now, you may think these were like special forces guys, you know, who really knew their, you know, I've heard stories said that when you drink that water with your hand, you can look around and see what's going on around you. So you're a top-notch warrior as opposed to those who just focus on the water and lapping it like dogs. Again, go with what you want. But the point being they took 300 men. Now, if you got special forces guys and all that, that's great. Okay, here's your battle instruments. A jar, a torch, and a trumpet. Really? You expect me to win a war with that? So he went out there and they defeated the Midianites with that. The story behind that is they made like they were a big army and faked the Midianites out. And the other thing is God gave the men a dream. So in the camp, they were already afraid of what the Israelites might do because they had some visions of them winning the battle and so they were over to take him and again on Judges 7 the Lord said to Gideon you have too many men I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel will be boast against me my own strength has saved me 
God, the powerful warrior. The lesson in life is that the battle being fought on the field is a spiritual one, and the battle that is won is purely because of the mighty warrior God. We tend to forget this despite the fact that most of us know that children's song, Jesus Loves Me, right? I don't know if I should sing or not, but what the heck. <laughs> Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong, right? And then we, we know this song, and unfortunately, we are no longer like children, and have come to believe this world and this life must be won by our own hands and ingenuity. It must be our power and strength that carries the day. Not so. Scripture reminds us that we should be able to see and understand is that we follow a mighty warrior God who goes before us, who we follow as opposed to try to lead the way and then call back for God for backup. He doesn't have our backs. He has what's ahead of us, what we face. Amen. Do you see the Lord at battle on your behalf? Do you see the little and big signs that remind you of his presence? Do you see the way he reminds us on a daily basis that we are dependent upon him? This life is not ours to conquer. This life is his to lead us through. We see how Elijah's servant had had his eyes open, but we also have a surprise ending to this story. The second eye-opening experience. In 2 Kings 6.16, Elijah asked God to strike the army with blindness. Now, this may have been a physical blindness. It doesn't really say either way, um, but perhaps it wasn't because he goes on to lead the army to Samaria, which I read was 11 miles away. Now, he he may have held their hands and made them, you know, watch that rock and led their horses and all that kind of thing. That may have happened. I, I don't know either way. But the fact that they were blinded um, may have just been the idea that they were confused. They no longer knew what they were doing and they trusted Elijah, who they had been looking for, to lead them away. I would think that it's more of a spiritual blindness that they were taken over by not understanding, which again, who's winning this battle? So it may not have been a physical blindness but confusion and lack of comprehension. They have the ability to see, but they don't understand, just like we've talked about already. Once in Samaria, Elijah says the same news words in verse 20 to open the eyes of the um, Arameans, and he used to open the eyes of his servant in verse 17. Verse 17, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. In verse 20, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. So the argument might be that when he opened the eyes of his servant, he could physically see already, okay? And the same thing goes along with these soldiers. I think they could probably physically see, but now they were made aware. Their minds and what they were seeing connected. Again, as was I was it doesn't appear, I uh, read that. Then the Lord opened their eyes, they looked, and there they were inside of Samaria. Now here's the surprise ending. They were surrounded by the Israeli army. Now the king of Israel, he gets all excited about this. You gotta remember, this is his enemy that's been pursuing him, bigger, larger army, and now they're delivered to his hand. And so the excitement can be said, there's not an exclamation point in the Bible to show his excitement, but he says, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? That's how, you know, you can read that. It's kind of like when you're a little kid and uh, your, your friend comes over and goes, hey, why don't you come on over to my pool and let's go swimming? And you go to your dad, you say, can I, dad? Can I? You know, can I kill him, Lord? Can I? You know, this is an opportunity I've been waiting for. And uh, so we so we fight and destroy the enemy. They had every right to destroy them. Instead, in verse 22, Elijah tells the king to set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. Not only did he eat and drink, he prepared a great feast for them. It doesn't make sense. In other parts of the Bible, you see where God had his men fully destroy nations. But here, he provides them salvation, forgiveness, excuses them. Instead of destruction, these deserving people get a great feast, deserving of punishment, unexpected grace, and mercy. Grace deals with others in ways they do not deserve, and mercy refrains in dealing with others in the way they deserve. 
So here's a picture of God who's not only a, a divine warrior, but he's also a merciful warrior. For these were enemies of God who rebelled and revolted against God. As enemies, they deserve nothing but complete destruction as others have witnessed and experienced elsewhere in the Old Testament. As soldiers, the Syrians would have completely destroyed the Israelites had they won this battle. Instead, the destruction and death, God provided them with life, salvation, and abund in abundance. Is this starting to sound familiar? He could have just sent them home, but that wasn't sufficient for God. God provided abundance and an overflowing blessings, a great feast. Now we forget we were once enemies of God when we followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. That's Ephesians 2.2. 2. But it's important to remember how the story ends in Ephesians 2.4. It reads, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. This passage in 2 Kings is the gospel told and experienced by the Syrians. Those who deserve destruction are given life in abundance. Now we might not fully understand what this abundance, overflowing grace and mercy may look like, but in this passage we see a feast was provided for the Syrians. We send to see abundance related to food. Scripture reminds us when abundance and overflowing abundance is spoken of, God shows us an image of food and eating and an eating table. Psalms 23, 5 talks about how God takes care of us. It reads, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Luke 15, the prodigal son returns. Many of you remember that story. The, the son goes out and spends his inheritance, winds up eating, uh, uh, I forget, winds up eating with the pigs and decides, you know, I need to go home. I could work for my dad and, and eat better better than this. And when he does, the prodigal son's returns, he says, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, and yet he is alive. He was lost, and now he is found. Take it the, Lord, the Lord's Supper, which we celebrate beginning each week, which we've already done today. The symbol of spiritual abundance. Now, granted, the table isn't flooded with food and all that kind of thing, but when you think about it in a spiritual sense, maybe opening our eyes to the bigger and deeper meaning of the whole thing, it's to share the abundance of the love of Christ, the, the abundance that we have. And sometimes we forget, and I think it's important when we do this, of course, hopefully, you were reminded of Christ's sacrifice sacrifice for you. And this love that he gives and did was out of his abundance. The symbol of spiritual abundance of the Lord's table, because it reminds us of heaven, as it is, says in Revelation 7, never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. I don't believe we're worried about eating and drinking in heaven. I think we understand that will be taken care of one way or the other. So I think we're talking about hunger and thirst, the spiritual fulfillment of being with our Father in heaven. But we talked about a little bit with addictions and stuff. I like to call it, we look for love in all the wrong places. We look for fulfillment. We're looking for, we're searching for something, and God can only provide that. Is it perfect now? No, but we get a lot from understanding God and reading the scriptures and committing our lives to him by loving others and doing those things. But in heaven, it's going to be the perfect fulfillment. There'll be no more wondering um, about your sins. There'll be no more wondering about, you know, anything. The problems will be resolved. A perfect fulfillment, a abundance of spirit love. It's an eternal heavenly banquet and buffet, far better than the golden corral and even better than the best Sunday potluck. <laughs> Those are pretty weak examples, but take the things you like in life. I heard this about heaven. Take the things and things you like about life and magnify that a hundred times over. That's heaven. Because you don't necessarily have that description, but you know what you like and you know what you enjoy. Heaven's going to be even better than that. He reminds us the food we eat, we may not see it, understand it, but all possess in our lives is really at the merciful hand of God. 
He is the one who provides an abundance even while in the valley of the shadow of death. So we may, we may um, pain is inevitable. This is, comes from my sister over there. Pain is inevitable, but suffering is not. And in the Lord, we may suffer in pain, but God is always there to protect us and help us through it. So we do not have to suffer. Our God is an almighty and divine warrior. Our God is also a merciful God. Do you see it? It happened. <laughs> Do you see it? Do you see it in your lives, in your heart, in your mind? In your relationships, in your families, in your church. It, it, it by the way, is the Holy Spirit. Or are your hearts and minds filled with concern, care, lack of faithfulness, grumpiness, grouchiness? Many of you know that the grumpiness and grouchiness part is me, okay? I'm not using these words to describe you, but when we let the world creep in and we're not following the Lord, these are some of the results we get. Do you see the Lord's hand at work sometimes in very small ways? Do you see it? May we see the world the way God sees it. May our eyes be open to the spiritual affairs of the world. May we be a light unto the world as opposed to the people who grumble and complain about everything else. Um, that's what we typically do, and I'm in on that. Don't, I'm not naive of that. But at the same time, we are the people that have God. We have his Holy Spirit. Let's look for it. Let's notice and pay attention. And if you haven't paid attention yet, you have haven't committed your life to Christ through baptism, we give you, offer that opportunity, either to learn what that's all about, how to do it, and make that commitment to the Lord. And, you know, I made a commitment to the Lord many years ago, and I didn't necessarily understand it. I knew I read it in the Bible, and God told me, repent and be baptized. And I did that, and I knew something else he told me in the Bible. He said, don't forsake the assembly, read my book, and pray. And that's what I've been doing ever since. And I can tell you, you, it opens up your eyes. You're no longer blind. I prayed for a, a sermon and it took me three weeks to figure out what I was going to pray about. I had read this scripture three weeks ago. Okay. But then when I said, well, why don't you preach about the things you've been reading? And I read this and I said, there's nothing there. What could possibly be there? And here I had the story of the gospel revealed to me. My eyes were open. So if you have any um, things you need prayed for, you can ask us as well. And then if you would um, like to commit to the Lord in baptism or are curious about how to do that, uh, please don't leave today without finding out more about that so that your eyes may be opened and continually opened to the Spirit of the Lord.